Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, so this talk is going to be about writing domain-specific languages. So I think the first question we need to answer is, what is a domain-specific language? Um, um, so uh, a domain is like a, like a business domain, a problem space. Um, so a domain-specific language is going to be a kind of language that is more suited to solving problems in that space than a general-purpose programming language. Uh, so Python is a general-purpose programming language. A domain-specific language, uh, uh, well, let's meet a few examples. So SQL, a domain-specific language. It's uh, much more efficient for writing a query against a relational database than uh, constructing some objects in Python that represent uh, the, the things that you want to query and the tables that you want to query from and so on. Uh, CSS, domain-specific language. Regular expressions. Who knew regular expressions were a domain-specific language? <laughs> Config parser, also in the standard library, a domain-specific language for um, uh, configuring things. Um, intended, in this case, for uh, people who don't know Python to change configuration. String formatting. So you've got two, two domain-specific languages for free here. There's uh, the uh, format um, uh, method on a string uh, is a domain-specific language that will um, uh, interpolate the things in curly brackets. Uh, and date times have a special under-under format uh, method. That means that you can use the str f time syntax within the curly brackets. Restructured text, that's a domain-specific language for writing technical documentation. So, um, what are the problems that those domain-specific languages are trying to solve? Um, so, one, I think, is you know, the readability of, of, the, of code using those languages uh, is going to be, or systems using those languages, is going to be better than uh, a nest of Python expressions and, uh, and syntax. Uh, and sort of also kind of as a, as a corollary, um, it's going to reduce the repetition in, in the code and uh, the, as you reduce the repetition and you reduce the amount of syntax, the, uh, the errors, you can, you're likely to make fewer errors, so the writability of the code improves. Uh, one of the other reasons that we might want to do this is to um, sanitize or manipulate the, the data as it's loaded into memory, or lo the, the, the structure as it's loaded from uh, a DSL into, into program memory. Uh, and then, as we saw, there's a, there's a use case where um, non-technical people um, are going to be, or people who aren't familiar with Python, are going to be manipulating these things. So. As Pythonistas, I think uh, we have uh, more constraints on what exactly we're going to want, because we want, we want to use uh, Python as our general purpose uh, implementation language, and we're just going to want to use the DSLs to uh, simplify uh, and improve our Python. So uh, we, need, uh, we need to use Python for implementation. We need to uh, trade off like where we want to inject extra expressiveness into uh, our Python code, uh, and sometimes we're going to use triple quoted strings to sort of put in uh, a, a small structure. We'll see some of that later. Um, and we're going to want to work with the kind of uh, patterns that are familiar to uh, Python developers. So uh, you don't want to surprise people by completely changing the semantics of, um, I don't know, square brackets or something, uh, if you're uh, working in a in a an environment where you're going to be just switching between those two contexts. So when we talk about sort of building a DSL, you're, you're generally going to be uh, converting some piece of text, uh, which might be sort of within your program code, but it could be uh, from another file into a structure in memory. Uh, so that looks a bit like this. This is uh, a made-up language uh, that you can imagine is for sort of uh, a service that grabs your logs and does things when a regular expression expression matches. And uh, in this case, uh, I'm I can, kind of uh, uh, thinking of this as a language that would be 
intended for non-Python people to write. So this is like uh, the user-facing interface of uh, a Python system. Um, and so we're simplifying the uh, and, and removing bugs from uh, the configuration of this by putting it into a language where we can sort of more easily uh, uh, express what we want to, to say and then not confuse people with Python problems. So the, the act of turning this, uh, this plain text into a structure is, is parsing. So what we're mainly talking about with domain-specific languages is, is parsing. And so, I mean, this talk could have been called like uh, a guide to parsing, uh, but I think once we draw out what we want to get to with domain-specific languages, we can sort of construct a more uh, coherent narrative that will sort of uh, uh, help us to understand how to design these things and, uh, and work with them. So. The first approach to getting a parser, I guess, is there is one built into Python. So uh, any code that you write in, uh, in Python, Python will be sort of parsed and will have structure in its own way, or when it executes, it will construct that structure. So we can manipulate uh, the, we can use all of Python's dynamic tricks to construct structure in uh, a more elegant way, but that doesn't necessarily execute with Python semantics. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, the first um, meta-programming approach I'm going to talk about is meta-classes. So you know what a class does in Python. Um, it is, you, you define it, uh, and then the, the object itself is a factory for instances of that, of that type. So uh, this here is a class um, called duck, and when you call duck, it returns a duck instance, and you can call a method on the instance. That's Python semantics. With meta classes, you can completely change what that class definition does and what the duck object that is uh, sort of assigned to the name duck by the, uh, the, the class definition, what that object will do. So here's one, for example. This is, uh, this is actually uh, something I wrote a few years ago. And I guess this is kind of similar to Scrapey. Um, but what we're going to do here is uh, define a number of XPath expressions uh, that will match against uh, a, uh, uh, a HTML document or something that has been retrieved from a URL. Um, and if you look at the example where it's actually called, it's not even returning a scraped review instance. It's going to return a dictionary. Who knew you could do that in Python? Uh, a very small number of people. Okay, so um, this is kind of an approach to uh, combining, um, like uh, creating, say, a function, or you're, you're creating one piece of functionality, but you're doing it in such a way that you can declaratively say, it, specify parts of the implementation. Um, and there's even like this uh, uh, part where you can inject custom functionality, like cleaning a value by stripping a, um, uh, a colon. Um, so how would we implement that? Uh, well, first of all, you need the fact. So the facts were, uh, you know, you've got sort of subclass of facts, but they basically all sort of take a, uh, an XPath expression. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you sort of, uh, you get an LXML document and you can then just evaluate the XPath and return the result. Um, the meta class itself, <clears throat> so there are two phases at which this, uh, this is going to inject code into the, um, into the, the class definition. So uh, I guess the, um, the new, the under under new method is called sort of at the point where your uh, class definition ends. So at the point where the indentation goes back and the name gets assigned, uh, at this point the under under new method will get called on the meta class. Um, and in this case it's just going to collect up the facts, uh, the, the in instances of fact that were defined in the class namespace into a dictionary for, for easier use later. Uh, and then the under under call, overloading the, uh, you know, the call, the parentheses operator, if you want, on the class object itself, uh, the default implementation would return an instance, obviously, and the, uh, by, by changing this completely, we're just returning a dictionary. So it's going to uh, evaluate all of those uh, uh, XPath expressions against whatever we pulled down from the URL, and then run any cleaners and so on. Uh, and then here's how you create the base class. So uh, 
this is, you could assign this on every instance of the scraper, but um, it's somewhat nicer to uh, create a base class and then extend from it. Uh, and that's all you need. So moving on, uh, here's another approach for uh, DSLs in Python, um, in, in Python metaprogramming, and this is uh, using sort of context managers to construct structure. Uh, there is a library that does this. Um, don't know what it's called off the top of my head. Um, I don't know, I don't like this that much. It's a bit sort of verbose and forced, isn't it? So, um, the, and also there's a, a, an implementation problem here that you have to be careful about, which is that uh, this is then not threaded. This is re requiring global state uh, that is, the, you know, all of these functions that have been defined here are somehow storing the state at w which they are uh, in the, um, uh, in constructing a, re a result document, unless they're sort of outputting it to a stream immediately. Um, so that sort of brings concerns about sort of thread safety and race conditions into, uh, into, the, into the mix. Another approach is operator overloading. So this is uh, uh, Django's uh, ORM. There's, so there's obviously the, the DSL where you keep doing double underscores and double underscores and you're constructing an expression which is uh, frankly awful. And the, uh, but what I'm going to talk about here is the, uh, the, the use of the pipe uh, to mean or. Because in Python you can't overload the logical or operator. You can overload the bitwise or operator which is the pipe. Um, and lots of things do this. Uh, there are problems with this. So this is a uh, this is uh, spotted in a real code base. Um, we're using, uh, there's some, some horrible stuff in here, frankly. <laughs> so this is using the ampersand operator to mean uh, not bitwise and, but logical and. Uh, and it's overloaded the uh, comparison operators, uh, so greater than or equals to, to construct an object that sort of matches that thing. That, uh, that is a representation of <coughs> Uh, the expression that would be, uh, I guess it's kind of deferring the, uh, the act of doing that comparison. And we've got this amazing, like, inlist thing. <laughs> you could spell an infix operator like that in Python. So um, it turns out, like, that is actually a, <laughs> uh, a left shift operator followed by a right shift operator. And then you take the spaces out, and it looks like an infix operator. And you'd implement it something like that, but don't look at that because don't do it, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the place that this really breaks down uh, is that the, so we can't overload the logical and and or operators. We can overload the bitwise and and or operators, but those are different, they have different operator precedents. So that means that the, whereas the and and or uh, are at the right precedence to, to make sort of simple, obvious code work. Uh, the uh, ampersand uh, binds more tightly, if you will. Uh, and so the, uh, I've actually seen cases where, where naive people have written the top one and meant the bottom one. Uh, sorry, meant, <laughs> wrote the top one and meant uh, what is, uh, yeah, was on that slide, so bracketed like that. Uh, and obviously that doesn't work. Um, so that's not very readable. So what are we doing here? We're aiming for readability, uh, but we've create, constructed a situation where you need to put in so many brackets to get the brackets right uh, that you're not really achieving the readability we set out to. Uh, here's another uh, example, a slightly different example, uh, kind of uh, related in our code base. But um, uh, this is where, uh, so we've got a, so the, the top example is how it's supposed to work. So we've got a table object, and accessing the name of a column on a table also returns a table. Uh, and then the intention is that you can filter down the table by an expression in square brackets like that. You, you filter, first you, you uh, compare, the overloaded comparison operator uh, that will return uh, a, an array of the, uh, the rows that you want, and then you can select using that, that list. But that means that table operators, when you compare them to, uh, to a value, uh, will um, return a list that is the same length as the table. 
uh, in number of rows. And that means that we've had people writing tests where they're trying to compare uh, a return value of a function to none. Um, and uh, obviously, so if you did assert is none, that would work. But that test pass, passes even if uh, you have a table. So overloading the operators is a, uh, well, overloading sort of comparison operators in a way that changes the semantics uh, will cause problems. Um, if you want to overload the comparison operators, uh, then make sure you return a Boolean that sort of makes sense in the way that Python normally works. Um, or otherwise construct a situation where you can't write that test uh, and have it incorrectly pass. Okay, so then um, I guess moving on to uh, a way of writing DSLs where, where you are uh, using Python's own parser, but not sort of inline uh, in the code. So uh, just as we've seen overloading operators and things, uh, but by using the AST module to construct the Python structure and then completely change that the way that actually executes. So uh, this is maybe slightly nicer than the, uh, the way that we saw writing this previously. Um, it means that the operator precedence uh, is correct and it's not very surprising to uh, a Python developer to, uh, in, in how this executes. Um, I don't know, I, it's, this, is a, uh, this is one of those tricks where there's like a certain elegance in it, um, but it's not extensible. So you can't ever take this beyond what Python can do uh, in its parser. You don't, so you, Python has uh, a very complicated parser and you can abuse all of those features up to a point and then no further. Um, the code here is like how you'd, how you'd uh, implement that. So ast.parse will give you Python's parse tree for a piece of code. Uh, and then there is an ast.node visitor, which will allow you to sort of walk through the, um, the AST and do something with it. So uh, in this case, we're just sort of returning a, I think we're returning something like a, a uh, like a, an AST, but of a different type of thing uh, where the, the semantics are um, sort of SQL semantics. Um, this is even more insidious. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is a uh, very similar to the last thing, but actually it's been completely hidden within Python code. So this is, don't think of this as any different to this. This is, this is explicitly like we're, this is a, a string, um, so it doesn't look like Python. Uh, it's gonna be executed as Python. In, in a certain sense, it looks, doesn't look like it's gonna be executed as Python. Uh, but over here, this looks like it's gonna be executed as Python. Um, but for certain reasons, the, uh, what this DSL is doing is sort of constructing a uh, 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 sort of, it was sort of um, statically analyzing what the code will do for various reasons. Um, but, wow, that's horrible. So e exceptions don't work in that. Uh, and, uh, and the behavior is completely different to uh, the way that Python uh, will, would execute that code. Um, that's very surprising to, to users. Uh, this is uh, another one that does a similar kind of trick, um, maybe a little more successfully, I guess, because uh, you pass in something that looks like a, a generator. Um, what that actually does is gets decompiled to uh, a structure, and then that gets turned into a SQL query uh, that represents what the bytecode would do in, uh, in evaluating that generator, uh, but over a database. So um, I don't know, I don't really have any particular feelings about that. If it works, it works. Um, but um, the, an interesting thing to note is that decompilation for uh, turning a bytecode into uh, a, a structure and, or, and then finally into a SQL expression is very similar to parsing a DSL because you're just converting a stream of bytes or characters into a structure and then converting that structure into uh, whatever else you want, evaluating that structure. So 
in summary over Python mesh programming tricks, I guess. Uh, there are some clever things in there, but then there's a lot of surprising things that, uh, or pitfalls, I guess, that can bite you as, uh, as you start working with these things. And obviously that won't be apparent immediately. You might sort of define this thing and go, wow, this is great. And then you sort of throw in a, a really complicated uh, expression and it's like, oh, I hate this. Um, there's a, uh, a really good quote that I saw in a blog post from uh, Mozilla last weekend, uh, which was that with good, abstract good abstractions uh, are a continuing source of, uh, of greatness, whereas bad abstractions are a continuing source of pain. So you really need to get your abstractions right, and this seems like if you get the, if you accidentally pick a painful path, um, you can uh, continue to suffer pain for a long time. Uh, of those approaches, I like meta classes the, the most because um, they don't really suffer from the uh, operator overloading things, or you can, um, uh, they don't suffer from those pitfalls in the same way. Um, it's just a way of uh, fashioning a piece of, um, uh, of functionality out of uh, a Python class statement, and that's sort of the intended use of meta classes, or one of the intended uses of meta classes. So then, moving on to a, like a different category of, uh, of how, we c how we get a, uh, a structure, how we get a parser out of, uh, uh, sorry, how we get a structure out of text, so how we get a parser. There are plenty of parsers that we have access to. So here are some. Uh, JSON and YAML are widely used. Uh, config parser, I mean, it's, it is intended specifically for this, um, but you could use it, you could abuse it, I guess. You could, create something completely different out of config parser. Um, but uh, we'll see some examples of this. So this is the Elasticsearch DSL. Uh, anybody familiar with this? Is it pleasant working with this? <laughs> so um, yeah, it's, this is, um, there are loads of curly brackets in here. Uh, and it's not always clear where the curly brackets should go. So my favorite bit is like you get to the end and there's just like an empty dictionary because like I don't even know what to put in there. It's, <laughs> you need the, the dictionary there. You need like exactly the nesting that you have there. Um, it's not a very elegant thing. Um, I guess you could uh, take the view that for Elasticsearch, this is, this is more like a wire level protocol than a DSL. It may not be intended for human, uh, uh, you know, for writing as a programmer. Um, you may expect to wrap it completely up in a nice Pythonic API. Um, but all of the Elasticsearch documentation is written with these, so you, you have no choice but to engage with this unless your uh, API provider redocuments all of Elasticsearch using their own components, uh, and they don't. So. Uh, this is an Ansible playbook. So this is a real mishmash of YAML and Ginger, and the, there are some loops in there, and there's like this magical lookup thing. I, I, so I don't know Ansible that well, but uh, this is the reason that I've not got into Ansible. It's, uh, this is just at the point where you just break free of this and write something new. Um, Puppet is good. So um, on the subject of Ansible, uh, sorry, on the subject of YAML for DSLs, uh, so I guess it's kind of tangential, but um, who can spot an error in this YAML document? Colon, right, colon, yeah. So uh, the colon in the middle of that line, uh, as a uh, sort of non-technical user, perhaps I'm, I'm writing just uh, some metadata for, for a thing, and I write the title as I've been taught to, and I put in a colon, and suddenly I've not got a list of strings, I've got a list of some strings and some dictionaries. So that's a potential pitfall. Who can spot the bug in this one? Uh, no, 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 that's a valid uh, string. So this will be a dictionary containing a dictionary of, uh, 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 that where the values are strings. No, no, indentation's fine. So, the, I'll tell you, uh, Ontario is keyed with the string on, and on 
evaluates to true. <laughs> so, I know, I guess that's, are you likely to run into that? Maybe not, um, but uh, I, I kind of think YAML has tried to do way too much. Uh, it's like a superset of JSON and it has a ton of features in there and nobody understands it that well because it's not, the spec isn't documented that well. Uh, and I think it's more of a so, sort of pseudo readable serialization format for, for kind of uh, more complicated stuff. It works really well as that. Um, I think it works maybe kind of in really simple cases as a, as a DSL. So um, in summary of the off the shelf parsers we can get our hands on, uh, there are, I, I guess, it's not very suited to your domain. It doesn't really fit. That's the, that's the overriding thing, isn't it? That uh, you're shoehorning a, a structure into, just because it's off the shelf and you're, you're uh, able to use that doesn't mean that it's really going to fit your domain well. Um, and uh, as your feature set grows, you're sort of struggling more to shoehorn all of that into the, uh, the expressiveness of those, those languages. So that brings us on to uh, the, the last category that I'm going to cover and the, I guess, the, the biggest category, um, which is parsing our own DSLs. So this gives you complete freedom to, to, to break free from any of the uh, uh, existing abstractions and start afresh and come up with a language that is completely suited to what you want to do. So uh, I've written a few DSLs in my time uh, and uh, this is kind of the approach that I take. So uh, you sit down with a, like a, a blank text editor and you start thinking about concepts from other languages or from other, you know, things that might be familiar to your target audience um, as, as kind of the syntactic uh, elements. And then you sort of, knowing your problem domain well, you sort of start to encode some of the uh, examples from your, your domain into uh, a text file. Um, and then you iterate over it and, uh, and eventually come up with a few examples of, uh, of the kind of language that you want to create. Uh, and then, having done that, you, should, you could be very proud of like, your language it looks really nice. Uh, and then you can straight away take those examples, break them into test cases, and uh, you can start coding. So, um, I kind of covered some of this stuff. Uh, when you are designing a DSL, you want to make it familiar to people. You want to make it uh, uh, work in sort of the same way as Python. Uh, one of the problems with the Puppet DSL is that scoping is just completely wrong. Um, so you ought to try and make it work as people will expect. It's the principle of least astonishment. Uh, and then how will you parse this language, I guess, is, is another thing. So you can't, if you can't parse it, you, it's not going to work. So, uh, once you understand a bit about parsers, then uh, you can design for the parser that you can write as well. Um, there's, there's one thing in particular there, which is that uh, it's very useful to embed DSL sometimes in Python string literals. And so uh, you ought to have like some sort of concept of uh, uh, what is going to be convenient to embed in a string literal and what isn't. And obviously you've got like sort of raw strings um, and, and so on, but I guess that's something to pay attention to. Um, I'll come on to that a bit later, I guess. Um, so I think the first approach that I usually take for, or the, the first approach that will work for, uh, for the simplest approach that will work for parsing your own DSL is to do it line-wise. So this is a DSL that I wrote. Um, this is, uh, so we have a tabular structure uh, in my organization, um, and there was a lot of code, and particularly test code written like this, so ri or written as the, the before. So there's a lot of syntax in there, there's a lot of quotes, um, and what also happens is those two lines start to drift apart, and uh, before long you've got like a schema defined elsewhere, and uh, what you're appending to it is no longer clear, it's no, no longer clear how the fields match up. Um, so I wrote this simple sort of line-wise DSL this is inspired more or less by uh, kind of lettuce um, or gherkin syntax. Um, but we have types in our table, so it needs, needs types added to it. Um, and then uh, 
that will always say, it becomes a very sort of literal style of uh, uh, testing where you say, this is my input, and then I'm gonna run a function and I'll get an output. And you can visually compare what the input and output are expected to be. That's a really great way of writing a test with these structures. Um, but then, to draw another point from what I was saying before, so uh, I was saying that if you're working within uh, string literals, uh, you know, think, consider that as a consideration. Um, this is sort of uh, tolerant of indentation and that kind of thing. So, uh, and also you can put comments inside the uh, literal in, on the end of the lines or before the lines, but not in the middle of the table actually. Um, so uh, it's flexible in those situations. It allows you to lay out your code how you, however you want. So to um, parse something line-wise, the way that, it, so this is sort of basically I'm considering writing a parser from scratch. Um, the way that I would do it, the way that I start doing it is to write a finite state machine effectively. So uh, you start in a state and then consider each line in the context of the state that you're in. And each line will cause a, a transition to another state uh, or maybe uh, output some value. Uh, and that looks a bit like this for uh, a language that has uh, headers and a body. So uh, there are four states there, of which two are sort of terminal states that sort of uh, uh, maybe aren't even encoded as states. They just sort of kick you out of the parser or uh, return an exception. Um, so in the expect header state, you get a header and you stay in the expect header state. But if you get a blank line, you move to the expect body state and then any line is, is body. Uh, and this is like something, uh, this maybe sample implementation of this is in a loop. Um, I, don't know, I don't want to dwell too much on that, but I think the, the thing to note is that uh, you're switching on, first of all, you're switching on the state. So you're not sort of evaluating the line and then considering it in the, uh, in the context of the state you're in. I think it's better to do it the other way around where you uh, take a line uh, and then switch immediately into uh, different blocks of code depending on the current state, um, which you can do as a class, though this is a, a sort of slightly more organized way of doing the same thing, I guess, which is that your current state is just encoded as a method and the, uh, by switching out the uh, method, in this case the bound method uh, that you're currently using in the instance, uh, you can transition states that way. So um, a finite state machine is like technically powerful enough to pass reg pass regular grammars. Uh, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> but uh, uh, I guess I don't know what that means because you can sort of start um, adding a stack and you can maintain state and you, you can continue building up this sort of uh, clumsy parser for, for a certain amount of time uh, and continue to parse uh, increasingly powerful stuff. Um, but you're considering one line at a time, but that doesn't mean that the structure is one line at a time. It means the structure can uh, move, uh, can span multiple lines and can switch states across those lines. Um, so I guess to, we need to dig into that a little bit further. Why can it span multiple lines? Uh, what does it mean to parse line-wise in the context of a bit more parsing theory? So, uh, quickly detouring into parsing theory. Uh, there is a book on this, and it is very mathematical, and uh, I don't really suggest you read it, um, because there are libraries that will just sort of bake all of that mathematics down into much more simple stuff, and we'll meet some of those later. Um, but to summarize um, the basic parsing theory, it's in uh, it's usually split into two phases. So there is the lexical analysis tokenization phase where you uh, given uh, a, just like a flat bit of text, you start breaking it into the words or uh, symbols that make up the language. And then given that sequence of symbols, you can start assembling it into a tree. Uh, lexical analysis is usually done with regular expressions um, and just sort of uh, what regular expression will match next. Um, indicates what token type and value it has. And then the syntax analysis has, there are various algorithms that are the really mathematical bit. Uh, so this is an example of the tokenized module built into Python that, that provides the tokenizer for Python. 
Um, it's rather simplified because it actually emits like all kinds of uh, data about each token uh, on an expression like x uh, to the power of y plus one. Um, it will output uh, the the tokens that you see there. So um, a left bracket, uh, let's sorry, left parenthesis, uh, the name x. So note that it has the type um, as well. So just the sequence of the the words, as it were. But white space is not one of those words. Um, and then, ostensibly consuming the output of tokenized behind the scenes, AST will uh, convert that into a structure. So uh, you've got like a nested bin op, um, where uh, op is a class and uh, a name is a, a class, and so on. So coming back to line-wise parsers, uh, this is this is all there is to uh, to sort of distinguishing line-wise parsers from anything else, that you're just taking a line as a token, but then all of the same practices apply. So if you've ever written a line-wise parser, you're not actually uh, that far from writing a parser that isn't acting line-wise. Um, and then I guess this brings me on to uh, a brief interlude where I wrote a line-wise parser for a game. I, so uh, in October 2014, I won Pi Week, which is a week-long games programming competition with an adventure game called Legend of Goblets. Uh, which is a kind of adventure stage play. So uh, there's a narrative and uh, the, um, uh, the characters are sort of moving around on a stage. It's almost defined as a stage, so there's like stage right, stage left. Um, and that's all scripted. Uh, and it's scripted with a language like this. So I literally sat down at the start of Pi Week on the Sunday. I was like, I don't know how to write an adventure game, but uh, I'll start by writing a script that I want to have. And very soon uh, I realized that this script needed to be executable. So I added all of the features that I need, so like choice came last afterwards, but um, uh, the, I started building a structure. Even before I'd written any code, I was like, this needs to evaluate and move people around the stage, and at this point, I'm gonna break out and have a puzzle and so on. Uh, if we have time later, I might show you that game. Um, so as I said, we're nearly at sort of full parsers. If, we, if we're considering a line as a token, uh, we've, we've written something that can uh, construct a, a whole AST out of uh, line-wise things. But there are tools that make this even easier. So we need to understand a little bit about how you instruct one of these parser generators to uh, parse an arbitrary DSL. This is the kind of stuff that you'll see when you're uh, describing languages. So this is a, uh, a sequence of productions uh, that define the grammar for a DSL. And in this case, this is like a simple calculator expression language. It seems to be like the de facto standard for demonstrating parsers, um, although it's kind of not that effective. Uh, not, it's, you know, it's not that useful a, a thing to write in the real world often. Um, but you notice that you've got sort of recursive productions where uh, an expression will match um, the, uh, an expression plus a term. So that means that you can nest arbitrarily many sort of uh, plus signs, for example, one, uh, you know, term plus sign, term plus sign, and so on. Um, and that will create a, a structure that is uh, sort of recurses on the left-hand side. Um, and the way that this grammar has been written is such that uh, the precedence of the plus and minus operators is correct uh, in, you know, as, as in normal mathematical syntax. Um, so what does that like left recursion mean? Uh, there is um, some, something that we need to know in order to construct a parser is about associativity. So if you have an expression that has uh, multiple op operators of the same precedence, then uh, whether they bracket to the left or the right. So uh, a left associative op operator, as I say there, is uh, brackets the left-hand set of expressions. And uh, Python is left associative for all of its operators? Okay, so all but one of its operators. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, yeah, so we need to know that. We, that. That actually sort of makes a difference on how our uh, expressions are evaluated. Uh, and the other thing that matters is operator precedence. We've already, already met, in a sense, but uh, that we need to know that uh, the expression that we write 
if, so if um, uh, plus and asterisk had the same precedence, for example, it would uh, construct the wrong structure. So we need to know that when we write sort of uh, uh, the simple unbracketed code, then it does that as, as it gets parsed, effectively gets bracketed in the way that you would uh, expect. Um, I kind of mentioned that, so I'm gonna skip over. I'm running low on time. So this is a, uh, a parser called PLY um, for Python Lex Yak. Uh, Lex and Yak are uh, well-known C parser generators. So uh, this is the, a Python implementation of those things. Um, and this is the tokenizer phase, which is equivalent to Lex. Um, so notice this is a DSL. Um, each of these is a regular expression uh, that will define a token type. And so the capital uh, letters in the, uh, the names of the things uh, are the token type. We've got to have a list of the, the tokens uh, also included in the module. And then there's some magic that turns that into Alexa. The number is slightly more um, complicated because the doc string is the regular expression. And then you can provide a mapping between what we actually pass, which is a string, and the value that we want to uh, return as like our tokens value. Uh, and then PLY uh, allows you to construct a parser, uh, like either in, a, in the same module or a different module. Uh, you just import the tokens and Alexa, uh, and then you're defining the grammar productions, another DSL, uh, as you can see in the um, uh, P expression bin op uh, for defining what the grammar is. And that's uh, in very much the same kind of language as the uh, uh, like BNF that grammars are often described in. Um, so to talk through this code a bit more, this is not constructing an AST in this case. This is uh, sort of constructing a parse tree and collapsing it down to a result as it parses it. So the operator is actually being pulled out and executed as it's being parsed. Um, that's, I, I guess that's just the rest of the, the parser. So uh, again, it will pick up everything in the module namespace and you call yak.yak .yak and you get a parser. Uh, and then you use it a bit like this, so parser.parse, and you give it the, the lexer again, uh, and then you can evaluate an expression. And because the expression is being uh, evaluated as the syntax tree collapses, just simply parsing, the result of parsing is the result. So moving on to another library, pyparsing uh, takes a different approach. So whereas uh, PLY implements uh, a couple of the really fast parsing algorithms, which are LAL, R1, and SLR, uh, pi parsing uh, is recursive descent, which is more powerful, uh, but also potentially much slower. So recursive descent allows the parser to backtrack if uh, it failed to match. And in fact, it can backtrack even if it didn't fail to match. So uh, it's trying to match tokens, uh, and it can, you can have it look for the best possible match of those tokens. Uh, and, uh, and try all of the routes through the code, which can be incredibly expensive. Um, my first pi parsing parser ran incredibly slowly, and I, I just used the wrong or. I didn't mean or, I meant match first. Um, so to talk you through pi parsing a bit, there are these uh, classes. Uh, there are lots of these classes, and they all have kind of a sim similar API. Uh, these ones are the ones that sort of match tokens. So there's a quoted string, that means that you can match uh, like a, a Python quotes or you know uh, from a, a quote up to uh, in this case it's from a single quote up to the next single quote excluding uh, single quotes that have been escaped with a backslash um, and unquote results there will mean that when we actually get the constant it's just been converted into the string that was represented by that so that's actually quite a powerful um, little bit of functionality there um, and then there's also uh, uh, re regular expression matches and just like a literal comma. Uh, and you can combine those. So uh, the, this is another DSL, the, <laughs> the operator overloading DSL where the pipe operator means match first. So it's, uh, there is a class called match first, but you can short circuit it by, uh, short, uh, shortcut for writing that is uh, to use the, the pipe uh, to match any of those things. This is kind of also defining something very similar to the grammar rules in, uh, in that sort of grammar, but defined in Python syntax. So uh, the productions here uh, are 
uh, the combination of those things assigned to another value, and that the, the thing that they get to assign to is also an instance of one of these parsing objects. Um, there's some stuff there about, so this value thing, uh, there's some magic there because it needs to be recursive, which means we've got to define it and then get it, its value later. And so that's where the left shift equals comes in. Uh, it's a bit ugly, and you know, this is the, the, the problem with operator overloading, I guess, that you, uh, you run into these kind of situations. Um, each of those parsers allows you to, in the same way that we saw in PLY, you can map the, uh, the token as it sort of uh, is returned from the, the match. In this case, you can map, uh, map the constant uh, production, which was uh, like either a string or a float or an int. And because I handily described those in uh, Python syntax, so you can use ast.literal eval to uh, evaluate its actual in Python value. Uh, and a list uh, is very similar, but um, you, because of the way that I've defined a list, which is with uh, interleaved with commas, um, as in Python, uh, you need to exclude both the uh, leading square bracket and the commas and the trailing square bracket, which is what that slice does. Uh, and then you use it just by calling parse string on any one of those things. So they all provide the same API as I say, they all provide set parse action and they can all parse uh, some input that matches. So here's another one. Uh, th there, are, you know, these, there are many of these, but they will all take s s more or less the same kind of approach, which is uh, matching tokens uh, and providing um, uh, a grammar that defines the language. Uh, and Parsley has chosen a different approach for its DSL for defining the, uh, the grammar there uh, of parsing its own string, parsing a triple quoted string. Um, so with these, uh, this was something I was able to write. I was able to rewrite that stuff that we saw at the beginning with all of those weird operators into something that would parse with exactly the semantics that I wanted uh, and proper error handling and matching things like is not null which is not something that's valid in Python. You can never write is not null. Um, well, you could, oh, sorry, you could write is not null. Uh, you, can write, you can't write um, uh, some of the SQL things like like and, and so on. Um, so that's much cleaner and uh, avoids all of the problems that we saw with uh, operator overloading and, and missing brackets and so on. Uh, I also use PLY to, to parse a metric definition language that's uh, kind of based on Puppet. Um, and that was quite useful at the time as well. So uh, I guess moving on from, uh, just to like sum up the, the practice of writing and working with DSLs, there's some stuff that you generally want to have that are nice to, to have when you're working with these things, which is, uh, first of all, uh, the ability to, having constructed an AST, to convert that back into some source that might represent that AST, turns out to be very handy. And it's very handy, handy for writing tests as well. Um, and also, you need to work quite hard to ensure that the uh, errors come out clearly with uh, the line number, because it's really horrible to have uh, a DSL that you're working with, and it just says, there's an error somewhere in there, you've like given it a thousand lines. <laughs> it doesn't help me at all. Um, and, uh, and things like syntax highlight, highlighting and linting. Um, this, for example, is how you syntax highlight in Vim. Uh, it's just a tokenizer, so it's just a set of regular expressions that uh, match certain types of, uh, of token, uh, and then the colors that you assign it to. I don't really want to go into Vim syntax, but there you go. So I guess summing up, um, there are tons of advantages to doing this. Uh, I found it very useful for uh, improving the quality of code, for making it more literate what you mean, and for reducing bugs, uh, but only if it's done very well. Um, you can also use, for example, the, the where expression that you saw, um, takes something that looks very much like SQL, but completely validates it, so there's no possibility of injecting any code in there. Um, and so that can use, um, so that can be used to protect yourself from all kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you encounter a project that is using tons of DSLs that you've never met before and you don't know what they mean and aren't very well documented, then that's, uh, that's a potential uh, 
uh, pitfall uh, for, for new developers. It makes it difficult to work with your project. Um, and also, by doing this, uh, if you sidestep uh, Python, you're presenting uh, a, a DSL that implements um, uh, something that is, you're gonna be working a lot with that you're going to produce large amounts of code in, uh, then you're gonna start missing the IDE support that you have for uh, Python, uh, which may just be, you know, Jedi is brilliant, but uh, it may just be syntax highlighting or autodoc, Sphinx autodoc. So there you go, I encourage you to go out and do it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, two things, I guess, uh, mostly irrelevant. One, are you now demanding that Python sprout magic methods for overloading uh, uh, logical and in or? <laughs> uh, no, I'm encouraging people not to try and overload operators generally. Okay, two. And two, uh, don't leave us hanging. How do you fix the, those YAML errors? Do you uh, use a backslash on both of them? or? Uh, no, you uh, use a different way of expressing yourself in YAML. So uh, you use uh, quotes. If you use quoted strings, uh, then they will automatically be strings. But there are other pitfalls, and again, sort of switching to another form of expressing yourself in YAML uh, will circumvent those, those pitfalls. Okay, but if you added quotes around both of the, yes. the colon problems and yes. the on problem, yeah. that would have fixed yeah. those. So, so YAML is a superset of JSON. So you can use quoted strings and uh, curly brackets and square brackets for lists and all of those things. About the YAML, in fact, when you use a Docker Compose configuration, you almost, at the end, have to everything quoted just in fear something <laughs> fails. Um, the question was, how do you feel Python compares to for example, other languages like Ruby or Haskell in order to build these Um I don't know about Haskell, uh, but I've seen some horrible stuff in Ruby as well. So it turns out that lots of the DSL, well-known DSLs in Ruby are written by uh, monkey patching the object, the object class, which is the root of all uh, objects, uh, or the, you know, the object hierarchy, uh, and adding methods to that. And then they're just like available whenever you want. Uh, but uh, monkey patching built-in objects seems like a terrible idea. Uh, but it's, it's highly encouraged in Ruby. In fact, the syntax in Ruby to like just open up a class and stuff more stuff into it. That's, yeah. um, perhaps I missed it, but which, which module did you use for your own DSL, the ACT? For so, which DSL? Uh, for, for the one for your game. Uh, so that was just my own parser written line-wise with oh, a right. state machine. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I, could, I guess I could show you the code for that, but it's, it runs to quite a lot of lines. The important thing for that is that, uh, so indentation is important and it needs to maintain like the state of indentation. So uh, each token, so it's not just a line, a line is, um, there's a tokenizer which turns a line into the amount of indentation it has and uh, the one, one of the regular expression patterns that it matches, so the token type and then the value of that token and that feeds into a finite state machine. So this bit of a plant question, really. Can we see your game so we can see the demonstration <laughs> of the DSL uh -huh. so we can see okay. what a wonderful thing it is that you've built for uh. us? <laughs> okay. Can we have less light in the audience, please? Act one. Do I have to click? No. Okay. Why? So this is the introduction. I won't spoil any of the middle bits for you. Uh, there is music. That's <laughs> No.
music's not working, okay. <laughs> no, there's no, there, so music isn't gonna work. Okay, right, so uh, I guess, let's fast forward. Ah, there's lots of dialogue here, it's telling the story, I'm not gonna. Okay, fine, right, so uh, suggestions for things to do. Go on, pick up the sock. <laughs> Another one? Oh, this is a bit, yeah, it's not, the animation's not working. Normally, yeah, uh, the skull. The skull. <laughs> I can't I can't pick up the kettle at this point. No, it just says look at kettle again. Talk to the parrot. Uh, but <laughs> uh, we could play through play through the whole thing here, but it would t yeah it takes probably about uh, half an hour an hour. Sorry, uh, that's not even a thing actually. That's just scenery. Uh, yeah, okay, that's an interesting thing to look at. So, uh, how many lines in your DSL for this game? Uh, so the DSL looks like this. Uh, without wanting to give too much of the plot away. Uh, Last line. <laughs> uh, 1100. And how many Python lines? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, 3000. Let's see some of the, some more of the DSL. Uh, Sorry? Uh, it validates as it passes it. It passes the entire uh, script for the game at the beginning. So, and I think it probably will say if it, wh on what line it runs into a problem, if it runs into a problem. Um, we, we get a few seconds for last um, question if you want, if you're more interested than the code. Right, okay. Okay, so th there's uh, like the system of uh, allow and deny um, that are bindings for actions that can happen in the game. So uh, in this, exactly the same way that you can define a script at, uh, at like top level and it will just play uh, for each of these bindings. When you perform those actions, it will play a set of scripts which could, can involve this debate with uh, uh, other characters and so on. It can, and can, can trigger uh, all kinds of operations. It can trigger uh, them giving you something, for example, that you might need to solve a, a problem. Okay, um, thank you, Daniel.